Hello and welcome to Turf Truth where we look at claims in the turf grass industry and ask, are they true? If you're new to the channel you may like to subscribe to be notified of new content. Today we are looking at a video that attempts to explain soil tests for turf grass. This video contains assumptions, general ignorance, and potentially hazardous fertilizer recommendations. This video is very important to understand because it is a textbook example of how to use soil tests to chase numbers and sell nutrients your turf grass probably does not need. The speakers in the video are recommending using a fertilizer high in phosphorus. Although phosphorus is a plant essential element and, occasionally applications of phosphorus are needed by turf grass, applying phosphorus at the levels recommended in this video are rarely warranted, greatly increase environmental risk, and, depending on where you live, may be illegal. So, without further ado, let's get started. We have Alan Hain Long here not, and Chris Borgman from MySoil all together. And we're gonna run through some soil test data and you know, hopefully you guys will get some great value out of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, really we use a, a little bit dis different testing method than the conventional methods of, of soil testing. And um, the reason we do that is we feel that this platform is uh, a very accurate representation of what, you know, plants are gonna see in the field, you know, during that season and really helps us guide, you know, in season management decisions, as well as some long-term decisions and uh you know, a little bit different than that traditional test. You know, we feel that the resin technology really just takes into account all of these parameters. Those of you who follow best management practices are likely using traditional soil tests. The ion exchange resin is a different type of soil test that exchanges hydrogen and hydroxyl ions for the various cations and anions in the soil solution. This technology was investigated in the 1990s by Dr. Earl Skogli at Montana State University. Dr. Skogli was a successful and well-respected soil scientist and authored numerous scientific papers and chapters on soil testing. However, none of Dr. Skogli's accomplishments provide any evidence to support the use of ion exchange resin tests for turfgrass nutrient applications. More on that in a moment. You know that we really went to college to learn about soil and soil testing and, and all those interactions that take place that really affect the availability of nutrients to a plant. And it really takes all of the, that information and combines it into one and then allows us to take our agronomy expertise, our knowledge of products, soil amendments, and really put that all together and really, you know, a perfect representation of this platform. Well, you have certainly created a perfect example of something. We don't want to say what, but it is a perfect example of something. So Alan, why, um, why my soil? Like what, what about it? That, did you find attractive that, that made you want to, you know, bring this one to the, to the DIY community? Yeah, a couple things. The first one is it's approachable. So traditional soil tests, while they're awesome, they require some extra math to be done. There's some extra information uh, that you need to have behind the scenes in order to really understand what's going on with your soil. Absolutely. We agree. But the information that you imply is too burdensome to toil with is actually a crucial component of an accurate soil test. Without it, all you have is numbers on paper and anyone's guess as to what they mean. And the other thing is it's more real time. I mean, we're DIYers. We're not somebody that's working on uh, a golf course for 25 years and, and things like that. We're a DIYer. I need to know what I can do today to make change. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Golf course superintendents work in real time as well. They need accurate data quickly to make timely changes to their nutrient program. One could argue superintendents require data more rapidly than homeowners, so we do not agree that this is a valid reason to avoid traditional soil tests in lieu of a new soil test that has not been confirmed to be correlated or calibrated for turf grasses. Uh, and then thirdly, these guys offered a technology for me that we would be able to incorporate this into our app, which we've now done, because the idea for me is, is to get this into the app so that it begins to inform the program in the app so then people can plug and play on our app. And we actually are making strides that way. And these guys have done a ton to support us that way. Golf course superintendents have access to that technology as well. Multiple platforms exist that allow superintendents to track their soil test values over time. So again, we disagree that this is a valid reason to avoid traditional soil tests. But Chris, you, there, there, you said there's some samples that um, when you're looking at mine or Alex's lawn as well that you wanted to, to review or go over. Yeah, so what, so what in this sticks out to you as, as, as fairly interesting? Nothing. Nothing on this graph is interesting agronomically. Other than the sad reality that many people use it to apply, or perhaps more accurately stated, misapply nutrients. Even pH we cannot determine whether it is in the acceptable range because the manner in which pH was measured is not a standard measurement that has been confirmed to be useful for turf grass. So I guess for me, I think it, it really just represents, I guess, a term that Alan uses, which is, you know, directional data. How do we use this information to guide, you know, these decisions moving forward? And I felt like 
this was a great representation of the whole platform and what we do and, and how we use, you know, this information. And I guess, you know, where we started on Alex's lawn in the dark um, kind of blue or almost black looking bars represent, you know, where Alex started. And um, from that, you guys applied um, an 8-24-12, if I remember from, uh, from your video. Let's stop right there. You should never apply an 18-24-12 unless you have a soil test that confirms your phosphorus levels are very low, or you are establishing turf grass on a soil that has also been confirmed to contain very little to no phosphorus. These types of high phosphorus fertilizers increase the risk of environmental impairment and should always be avoided unless you have good evidence to include it in your nutritional program. And by the way, any anecdotes that the 24 works is not evidence. The plural of anecdote is not data. Again, just showing the sensitivity of the the test and the ability to pick up this movement over time and again, moving in a direction, right, to, to improve, you know, turf quality. It really was interesting when we looked at, you know, what ha happened after that application, right? It looks like maybe we didn't really follow up or we didn't stay on a plan of that balanced fertilizer, like, you know, a 12-12-12 or, you know, a triple 16. You know? Do not apply a 12-12-12 or a 16-16-16 unless you have a very good reason. Those reasons start with a soil analysis that indicates your phosphorus is deficient, or a non-treated turf grass plot is used to confirm a phosphorus response. So, they might say, but this test indicates low phosphorus. True. But what they don't realize, is that this test is essentially useless for recommending nutrient applications to turf grass. In order to have any confidence in a nutrient recommendation, this test must be calibrated to each nutrient and turf grass. What may be low phosphorus for one turf grass, may be adequate for another. In the absence of calibration, there is no way to know what the values mean, and therefore the optimal range is only a guess, but, it is an excellent way to sell unnecessary nutrients. More on calibration in a moment. We're only going to apply calcitic lime and see if in the spring it shows up. Because we got plenty of time, we can always put down um, a dolomitic later on to bring the magnesium up then. But let's just let's see if we apply something in the, in the winter, like what happens in the spring. And if you notice, like the the rightmost bar, this one right here, mm -hmm. you see how that's reflected. And we only we put, we put down at like um, 20 pounds per thousand, so not super heavy for lime. But it was really cool to see that that change being reflected in the test because it's because pH is one of those things where depending on the soil you're dealing with, it's, it's always difficult to know um, if you apply, you know, X amount of product, you're going to get, you know, what, what results you're going to get from it. So it was really cool to see just from us doing that light application, um, seeing the response in the, in the spring test. And it is not surprising that you see a difference before compared with after you applied a nutrient. The ion exchange resin is measuring the concentration of soluble ions in the soil solution. However, this tells us nothing regarding the amount of nutrient that you should apply. All it shows is that you applied a nutrient and that nutrient concentration in the soil solution increased. But the important part is that this test does not tell you whether that increase was necessary. Yeah, I didn't know that part of it. So that's really neat. I mean, we can see if we look at the pH over time, we can see, you know, kind of the more we applied nutrient um, as he kind of got into the um, the turf game management game, you know, we see the pH kind of goes down because most of those products are going to have probably some acidifying effects, you know, the more we apply during the, the season. So we see that and then we see the ability based on the data to come back and kind of bump that back up. Um, and so that's a really cool, cool thing that I didn't know. Again, this is completely useless information. First, there is no way to confirm whether the pH reduction was necessary. And second, there is no way to know without an untreated check plot whether the pH reduction and subsequent increase would have occurred randomly. This is again, the, the way the test works. And I always like to try to clarify this so people know it's showing potential, meaning this is what you could potentially pull from your soil right now. That's kind of, is that a layman's way to, a better layman's way to explain it? This is actually not too far from the truth. Traditional soil tests are designed to extract nutrients that are predicted to be available to the plant throughout the growing season. So in this regard, Ion exchange resins are similar to traditional soil tests. However, unless those data have been properly calibrated, this soil test, and any other soil test, should not be used to recommend an amount of nutrient to apply. Let's take this time to explain what calibration is, and its importance. Soil test calibration is the process of ascertaining the meaning of the soil test measurement in terms of plant response. The purpose of soil test calibration is to describe the results in easily understood terminology and to simplify the process of making fertilizer recommendations by placing soils in response categories. The terminology often used to describe categories is very low, low, medium, high, and very high concentration ranges. So, without calibration, the numbers on this report might as well be a table of random numbers. 
and the recommendations might as well be pulled out of a hat. Ruta, vota, zut. With like that second test where you see they applied some FERT, and then I'm sure you waited several weeks or whatever to test, yep. and you're seeing, hey, if you don't do anything, this is what you have the potential to pull out of the soil right now. Is that a, a good layman's way to explain it, Chris? Yeah, if you don't do anything, you can kind of look at your lo levels where they would be sitting if you didn't you know, do anything or apply anything. So what's that soil providing as it sits there kind of naturally? Um, you can see the, those levels. And then again, like Alan said, we can see you know, once we start these applications, our ability to move those numbers and hit those ranges that we've developed. Oh, perfect. You have developed ranges. What Chris is saying here is that his company, presumably, has sufficiently calibrated this soil test to turf grass response. If that is true, please show us the data where you develop these ranges. What turf grasses have you developed these ranges for? What variable did you use? Growth? Color? Density? Quality? Do you have specific ranges for each turf grass such as fescue, bent, Bermuda, St. Augustine, Zoysia? And to be specific, we are looking for refereed, published data. We do not want to hear anything about proprietary data, we are not looking for anything in the gray literature, and we are not looking for anecdotes. We will be waiting, but we won't be holding our breath. It is just a toy, now stop it! What these results are showing are literally right in line with what we did last year. Outside of that Brandt Supreme Green that Chris was mentioning, um, the two main micronutrients that it contains are iron and manganese, and you can see that being shown in the test. It has nothing for zinc, copper, or boron, not in any kind of meaningful amounts, and you can see in the test, those never really move. Let's talk about micronutrients. Soil tests for turf grasses are useful for a few things. pH salinity, sodium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and manganese. On this test you will see nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, iron, zinc, copper, and boron. None of these nutrients should ever be applied to turf grass based on a soil test. There are different reasons why each of these elements should not be applied, but in short, none of them have been sufficiently correlated or calibrated to a turf grass response. We are making headway with nitrogen and there are some new tests that are showing promising results. But until that test has been properly calibrated, it too should not be used to apply nitrogen to turf grass. What I've seen, I've never seen anybody do this many tests in one year, but what I see them do is year over year. And so what they do is they'll do a test at the beginning of the year. They're like, okay, now I know what I need to do. They go all year and they apply. Well, then they go the next year and they test again. And they're like, oh, well, my levels are still down. I'm like, well, yeah, because, but how did your lawn look? Well, it looked awesome. Great point. So the soil test shows that the values are low. The test recommends a nutrient be applied, but the turf grass looked fine. Do you see what we're getting at? So Chris, so what else is new with you guys? And just show, you know, what, why one product may cost a little more than another and what chelation is. And then, you know, obviously the data to back that we're replicating everything we're doing. You are replicating research? Great. As we said earlier, show us the data that supports your ranges. And remember to be specific. We are looking for data for each turf grass and soil. Well, there you have it. The first Turf Truth Tuesday done and dusted. We hope you all have a great week. Be sure to check in next Tuesday where we take a look at this. So potassium is another one of those when it's higher in your fertilizer, it's going to give you a green color. See you then.